Proverbs chapter 25, let's look in verse 19. Proverbs 25 and verse 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. The times of trouble we face reveals those who are faithful or not. Troublous times reveal unfaithfulness, such as a painful tooth always happens at the worst possible time. <laughs> Seems to be a big meal is coming up and your tooth is hurting. Uh, or a foot out of joint. A broken tooth hinders the function of sustenance. A foot out of joint hinders the function of walking. So one who is unfaithful will hinder the function of love. Sometimes the unfaithfulness of others teaches us to trust the Lord more. Perhaps we're trusting that person more than we should. It may be our dependence upon him takes away our trust from God. Depending upon him for encouragement instead of depending upon God for that encouragement. The definition for unfaithfulness from Webster's Dictionary is one who is not observant of promises, vows, allegiance, or duty, violating trust or confidence, treacherous. Not observance of allegiance or loyalty related to duty. It's one who violates the trust of one who is expecting that trust. And to be treacherous is to be disloyal, untrustworthy, or underhanded. A man can be faithful in some ways and unfaithful in others, showing his own agenda as opposed to his beloved friends. Loyalty or faithfulness will seek to build up and to strengthen Listening to the criticisms against a friend, being open to that criticism, is an indication of a lack of faithfulness. Should bring the criticizer to the one to whom loyalty is expected, not to tear them down, but to seek restoration of a broken relationship. This unfaithfulness will be as painful as a broken tooth and render one's friend as a foot out of joint. Doesn't mean there's not room for disagreement, but keeps it between them. God's desire is to understand the need for faithfulness to one another. Faithfulness is a part of love that God would work in us. And so he wants us to serve him faithfully as well as serve one another faithfully. Because to be faithful to him is to make us faithful to one another. Proverbs 20 adds, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. To find a real friend is hard to do. To find a faithful friend is even harder. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for those who have been faithful to us through the years. We thank you and praise you for your faithfulness to us. And I'm trusting you to use your example to teach us how we can be faithful to one another. We thank you and praise you for the way you've worked in our lives. And we're trusting you to use your word in our hearts as we celebrate today the time in which you sent your son, that day in which he was born, we thank you and praise you for why he was born when he came to die for our sins. Lord, we know that you spent a great deal of effort in preparing your people for his coming, in preparing our hearts for coming to you. And I'm trusting you to use your word in our hearts to point us to yourself, to strengthen our walk with you, our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Galatians chapter 4 is the text of our message. Galatians chapter 4, we will not be having children's church today. We'll be uh, keeping everyone together just for a few moments. Uh, I promise I will not be long, uh, but that is a relative uh, statement given by a preacher, don't forget. So I'll do the best I can, all right? <laughs> Galatians chapter 4, we're looking at verses 4 and 5. As we approach the day in which we celebrate the birth of Christ, there's a lot of indicators of that, that that day is coming. Stores and radio stations started focusing on Christmas music uh, weeks ago. Feeks, folks are thinking about gifts for loved ones. Many are spending a lot of time and effort in decorations and in their yard displays trying to impress the neighbors. Uh, and then final plans are being made for visits with family back home. The preparations for Christmas Day make the weeks before a different kind of a season, a different atmosphere, a different mood. As adults remember the joys of earlier Christmases and children anticipate all the joys to be found in the gifts under the tree. 
The preparations for the first Christmas also took a lot of time. God worked in Israel to get them ready for the coming of his son. You could say the entire 400 years of the intertestament period. But actually, it's more like the whole time from creation, God was preparing them for the coming of his son. When he made the statement to, uh, to Eve uh, that uh, he would bruise the, the head of Satan. You could say that God was busy preparing the people for that first Christmas so that he could bring his gift to us on a tree. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What a, a wealth of information is in these two verses. What a joyful proclamation he's making here. The fullness of time was come. The time was full of preparation for his coming. Um, God's timetable was ready for him. And the day God sent forth his son, it was as if he spoke to his son and said, Well, son, nine months before his birth, he said, It's time for you to go. Nine months before his birth, the time was full. The son left heaven, knowing the separation that would come between him and his father when our sins were laid upon him on the cross. The father sent his son to die for us all. He was born literally to die. The son went to have our sins laid upon him. Uh, I believe it was mentioned in praise time. No other king would do that. Certainly no one who claims to be uh, a God would ever do anything like that. Made of a woman, referencing his virgin birth, made under the law in that he came to fulfill the law. But notice verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law. His purpose was to come to provide redemption. He was there to provide a way to adopt us into his family. You know, when a young couple gets ready to adopt, they've got to jump through all kind of hoops to be able to, uh, to receive uh, a child. Uh, but God, shall we say, defines his own hoops in order for us to come to him to receive his gift so that we can become his child. There needs to be a sorrow, genuine sorrow for sin that has offended the holy God. And then recognizing his justice, the need to humbly repent towards God, to see him in a new way, to recognize that you had disregarded him before, but now he is all important. And then faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ for his gift of eternal life. The holy God would adopt us, sinful men, so we could become his children. Now, I admire couples who focus in their adoption procedure, they focus on children that have some kind of affliction. We were all afflicted with sin, yet he wants us to be his children. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, we are all afflicted, and yet he wants us to be his children. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's amazing to us that he would want us to be his children. None of us had anything to offer. <laughs> None of us had anything that we could say, look at me, I've got something that you need, Lord. <laughs> but yet he looks at every one of us and is willing to adopt us as his children. I think of the story of the king that was looking in the, the slums of his, of his uh, kingdom, looking for a peasant to become his son. And that's what God was doing for us. He came seeking us out to save us, to make us his children. Um, as we think about this matter of the preparation that God was working in the nation Israel, uh, particularly, but the world as a whole, we look at the intertestament period, a time of final preparation for his coming. Now, we know ab about the story of Israel's rebellion and going into idolatry and rejection of their, their God that led to a, their destruction and dispersion for 70 years. Israel, uh, from the time of their dispersion, they came back uh, to Israel and in the 400 years of silence, uh, there were five nations that 
came through Israel conquering as they went. All gained control at the expense of many Jewish lives. Each nation had its own influence, particularly Alexander the Great, um, but all of them had some. And many of the Jews that when they sat under this new ruler, they would figure out how they can they could butter them up, and so they would compromise their Jewish traditions and the, the things of the law in order to gain favor. They were very pragmatic. Through all, they had two that were Jewish rulers in that time, in the Maccabees and the uh, Masmonians, but the rest of them were all foreign nations. But through all seven of them, there was, there was a faithful remnant. Through all seven rulers, there were some who were not faithful. They were pragmatic. They were out to get what they could get. There was Persia that ruled for 150 years. After them, the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And this was probably the largest shift in the culture of Israel <coughs> because Alexander the Great was one who would spread his Greek influence. It was called Hellenizing. Uh, so he was the great Hellenizer as well. That he would institute Greek culture in every country that he conquered. He would set up a city-state in each land that he conquered and build public buildings, gymnasiums, theaters, art, places for art, uh, and the architecture would, would be reflected in the, the Greek mindset. But along with that, many of the Jewish ordinances began to be watered down. The Ptolemies followed in which the Jews were more and more divided between those that would accept the Hellenization of their culture and then those that were called Orthodox, who would resist it. The Syrians came next, and they sought to force the Hellenization on the, uh, on the Jews, uh, even creating episodes in which there was some real, uh, some real persecution. Then the Maccabeans uh, revolted, a timid priest was forced to perform a pagan sacrifice in a, uh, in a synagogue, and so Mattathias was a Maccabee who killed him and the Syrian embassy that demanded it, uh, and he, he would, became the first Jewish leader in this time. He escaped uh, from the Syrians, and folks came to him in large numbers, and their revolt began to be very, very strong and they ruled the land of Palestine for a while. After him, the Masmonians were Hellenizers, and these, these folks, they allowed the Hellenization, encouraged it, and the ones that were leading in the, in the project of making Israel into a Greek city-state uh, were the liberal Sadducees as they gained control over the culture. The ones who were the Maccabeans were also the orthodox ones, and they were the ones that were lifting up the law, and they were holding forth the law, and these became the Pharisees. Their purpose was to lift up Scripture to begin with. It was a very noble purpose. There was a continual bitter struggle between the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well as, as other groups that were around. Uh, but by the time of Christ, it was mostly the strongest uh, forces in control of the Jewish culture were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then Pompey came with his Roman legions with all of the uh, massacres that he did, and as God prepared his people for the coming of his son, they were crying out desperately, Lord, where is the coming of Messiah? In all this history, there were the, these two basic belief systems. The Sadducees, which accepted Hellenism, was liberal uh, in the sense that they rejected the supernatural aspects. The Bible was filled of, with fairy tales and myths. And the fair, they were more pragmatic. They were seeking just to get along. It was generally out of that group would come the tax collectors or the publicans. The Pharisees were the Orthodox Jews, and they were very religious. They sincerely desired the law, and they would, the problem was that they would add some traditions, intending at first to be commentary to help people understand the law, but eventually they became an end in themselves, and the real intent of the law was lost, and eventually pride set in, and some Pharisees were going to be better Pharisees than other Pharisees and so forth, so they would add more and more rules and traditions. 
Uh, so they, out, they sought to out-Pharisee other Pharisees. <laughs> well, the re reflections of the Orthodox Jews who yearn for purity, who yearn for righteousness in their nation, grew more and more intense as these godly people that were still there, this faithful remnant who were still there, yearned for the coming of their Messiah. Simeon was an example from Luke 2. We read about him in a previous message. But he made the statement, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation as he held the baby Jesus, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. God had prepared the nation, and Simeon was given discernment by the Spirit of God to know that that preparation had been complete, and here he is. Along with him was Anna, and she gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. There were still some who were looking for, for redemption. She served God night and day with prayers in the temple, a very godly woman. She know folks who yearn for God's redemption out of all of the liberalism and the pride of the Pharisees. She knew some people who were sincerely yearning for God's redemption, and she told them about the baby Jesus. He's here. He's here. I held him in my arms. The cry of believers throughout the land were lifted up, and finally the day came that God the Father knew it was time. He prepared the people. He was working in the hearts of men. The leaders never accepted him, but the bulk of the people were very open because God had prepared them. And the Lord says to us today in 2 Corinthians 6, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Just as he had prepared folks for his coming in that day, so today he prepares the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. When he speaks to our hearts, it is imperative that we understand the message to, to us. Uh, he speaks to our hearts through his word, helping us to understand how we must humble ourselves before him, how we must recognize that our only hope is found in Jesus Christ. If a person is a believer but their hearts have grown cold to his Savior, then God works in his heart as well to prepare him to respond to his word, to come to him in submission and love. This is ultimately why we celebrate Christmas. If you have not trusted Christ as Savior, if you were raised in a Christian home and there was no conviction, you do not see Jesus as your only hope. You need to recognize the need to trust him as Savior. Uh, if you are a believer whose heart has grown away from the Lord for whatever reason, now is the accepted time to repent. If you have not trusted Christ, now is the accepted time to come to him, trusting him for salvation. If you are a believer who humbly loves him, then rejoice in your salvation with him and keep growing in it because there is so much more as we learn to know more about him. We absolutely should celebrate his coming to earth for us. The most important part for each one of us is our humble rejoicing in his gift of eternal life and the wonderful opportunity we have to know him, to love him, and to serve him. Anything less than that just doesn't see him as he is, even on his birthday. I thank the Lord and praise him for sending his son. Uh, appreciated our praise time so much because in reality it's very true. The joy in heaven. Jesus said, uh, the Lord spoke of this at, at his crucifixion uh, when he mentions in Hebrews 12, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. That's why he was born. He did that for us. Uh, we have such an awesome opportunity, not just at Christmas time, but throughout the year to rejoice in him, to celebrate his coming, to celebrate his work in our hearts and lives. So let's do that today. As we remember Christmas, as we remember his birth, let's rejoice in that which he has done. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for the magnificence of your goodness. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for his willingness and your willingness to be separated 
because of the stink of our sins upon him as he hung on the cross. As we celebrate his coming, recognizing the joy that is in heaven when we trusted you, help us to recognize that you continue to joy over us with singing. And I pray that we would continue to joy over you with singing, praising you for the magnitude of who you are and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we rejoice. Amen.